Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. So glad you chose Trinity as your place of worship today. If you're online with us, welcome to you. We've come here to lift our voice to the God of the universe. Amen. The God of creation, our Redeemer and our Savior. And uh, we going to sing together and it's it's kind of uh, funny that we meet together and sing it's it seems like we don't do that a lot but uh, the reason we do that is because there's 400 times where the bible talks about singing and over 50 times where we're commanded to sing we're directed to sing and why is that well i think it's because god himself loves to sing in zephaniah it says god exalts over his people with loud singing and Jesus, on the eve of his crucifixion, he sang hymns with his disciples. And I think it's in Ephesians where it says that one of the effects of being filled with the Spirit is that we would come together and that we would sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs together. Why? We sing them unto the Lord because God wants to hear us sing. And so we're going to do that this morning. Let's stand together. I want to read from Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord, and I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord, how profound your thoughts. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age, and they will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, The Lord is upright. He is our rock, and there is no wickedness in Him. Pray with me. Father, we come here this morning to sing to You, to proclaim Your goodness, to proclaim Your greatness. You've had a plan since the beginning of time to redeem the world that you've created. You are loving and sovereign over this world. And thank you for bearing our sin and shame on the cross. Thank you for taking our punishment. We are so sorry when we fail to remember that you accomplished that for us. And it's not because of anything that we've done. It's because you freely gave yourself in obedience to the Father and the love for those rejected you. Lord, there's so many reasons. We just, we, we can pick a few this morning. There's 10,000, there's 10 billion reasons for us to praise you. And we want to worship you and lift up your holy name this morning. Amen. Sing to Bless the Lord, oh my soul.
103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Think a minute uh, this morning, just in recent days, something that you can lift to the Lord this morning is, and say, thank you, God. Thank you for your faithfulness. And may it encourage your heart, your mind, your spirit to just open up before him this morning as we hear his word, as we stand in his presence, as we sing to him, as we love on him, as we go to him in prayer. As we are with him this morning, may that energize uh, your openness to him. He wants to, to move in and through us. He wants us to make us uh, stronger. He wants to encourage us. And may his Holy Spirit do that this morning as we open up to him.
thank you, Lord, for uh, your goodness to us. Uh, we just are so pleased, so at peace, so hopeful for your faithfulness in our lives, for your grace and mercy in the past, in the present, and, and what we know of in the future. We praise your holy name. Amen. Listen to this great ministry from our choir. Welcome to Trinity. It's Family Food Sunday. We're happy to have you. If you're new or if you're a guest, please stop by the Connect Desk. As you leave, we have a great gift. We'd love to meet you and get you connected. Hey kids, in your clipboards today, you've got some fun activities to help engage you with our service. And make sure you make your birds today. We'd love to see your origami birds after service. Next Sunday, February 6th, it's our informational meeting about journey groups. If you're interested in learning about the path, the spiritual pathway to discipleship. Um, come to that meeting at noon after church. David Torrey will be there to give you all the information you need to get started. Also next week, our book clubs are beginning. Get registered. We have two great books for you to choose from. Get to know new people. Get online. Online families, join us. We want to see your face. Sign up now at our events tab. High schoolers, Spring Hill is right around the corner. Grab your friends, get registered. We wanna see you there. It's sure to be an awesome time. You can register for that now. And don't forget, before you leave today, we have giving boxes in our gathering space. You can put your envelopes right in, or you can choose to give online at our app and at our website. Thank you so much. Fourth and fifth graders, are you here? Are you in the house? This next announcement is for you. Hey, fourth and fifth graders. I'm so excited that you guys and all the other Trinity kids are here in big church today. 
I wanted to let you guys know, and we've talked about it a little bit, Junior Winter Blast. It is going to be Friday, February 25th to Sunday, February 27th. We are gonna be going to Gladwin, Michigan, which if you think of the mitten, it's gonna, it's up north for us. But we're so excited to go get away. There's going to be some awesome worship times, just some time for us to um, grow together in our faith. Um, also, we're gonna be going and doing some winter tubing, fun games, like I said, and then also there's gonna be fun food. Please come along. Registration ends on Feb Wednesday, February 17th by 5 p.m. And now Trinity Church, let's prepare our hearts to hear from Pastor Mark today as he preaches from the book of Matthew on fighting temptation and how Jesus fought temptation. So let's prepare our hearts and boys and girls, let's turn on our listening ears. You're such a good team. I love uh, the whole team that we have. Dana, giving some great announcements, Alyssa, uh, our youth staff, uh, I'm really thankful. And even the worship team, you guys thankful for them today? <laughs> and the choir? Woo. I'm Mark, and uh, I have the privilege of being pastor around here, and I uh, love doing that. Today, we're going to jump in, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, as we get into our series called The Good and Beautiful Life, we're looking at Matthew, chapters 3 through 7, and Matthew's gospel tells about Jesus, and talks to us about what it looks like to have faith in him, what it looks like to trust in him, how to grow in our faith. And those particular chapters really are about discipleship or following Jesus. And so we've been at this for a couple weeks and we talked at first about following Jesus and Jesus called to us to live uh, as his disciples, to live uh, as believers in him, to trust in him, to have eternal life, but also to live the good and beautiful life now, not just eternity, but to live the good and beautiful life now. And we talked in week one about the fact that there are two ways. There's the Jesus way, and then there's the non-Jesus way. There's following him, living life according to the way God made us to flourish as human beings, or live in any way, any way else. And last week, uh, David talked about the kingdom. John the Baptist shows up on the scene and preaches the kingdom of heaven is near, the kingdom of God is near. This way of life that God has created for us that exists in eternity is the life that he wants for us now. And so the contrast is the kingdom of heaven is the good and beautiful life kind of way, and the non-kingdom of heaven is the non-beautiful way. And so one of the questions that's come up, one of the comments that I want to deal with just directly today is this question, uh, a comment really. It's, it's this comment that says, man, it would be way easier to live the good and beautiful life and not the non-good and beautiful life if there wasn't so much temptation. If it wasn't for all the temptations that I go through, temptations to greed and to lust and to envy and all the different things that are really this way of life, the way of life non-Jesus way uh, versus the Jesus way, I, I want to, but it's difficult. It's challenging. It feels like, uh, like the old saying goes, opportunity knocks once, but temptation just leans on the doorbell in, in my life. Or as one old actress used to say, I generally avoid temptation except uh, when I don't want to. Uh, so, um, so what does it look like? So we're going to look at Jesus today, and we're going to jump in right where David left off last week in Matthew 3. John the Baptist came on the scene, and now he's going to baptize Jesus. And so we're going to learn along the way what it looks like in Jesus' life to fight temptation. And along the way, we're going to learn some great church history. So let's dive in. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew 3. And here's, here's how it begins in verse 13. It says, Jesus left Galilee, went to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John kept objecting and said, I don't be baptized by you. Why have you come to me? Which is a natural question. Jesus answered, for now, this is how it should be because we must do all that God wants us to do. Then John agreed. So Jesus was baptized. And as soon as he came out of the water, the sky opened he saw the Spirit of God coming down on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, This is my own dear Son. I am pleased with him. That's a fascinating passage on all sorts of different fronts. We're not going to focus on this as much today, but when you see that passage, a couple things are really cool. One is that you may have heard, maybe it's a Muslim friend, maybe it's somebody who's an atheist, and they're trying to trick you, and they say, The term Trinity is never used in the Bible. 
And that is actually true. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. That was uh, a term that was uh, uh, used later in the church history to describe Father, Son, and Spirit. One God, three persons. And one of the great places in the New Testament that you see this, it's all over, is in this passage. You have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit, all in one place, all God, all together. Uh, so Trinity as a word may not be in the Bible. Trinity as a fact, as an actuality, is all over. And this is one great place. So that's maybe a trivia question for you, but maybe it's helpful for you. You also see in this passage something that's really, really important. As the Spirit comes down, it looks like a dove kind of fluttering down. And so kids, uh, you have an origami dove that you can make as, as if you uh, came in. We don't have that? Oh, yeah, we do. All right. Just, you can make an origami dove. But here's the important theological point. Jesus, in order to fight temptation, has the Holy Spirit come on him. The same Holy Spirit that comes on us when we trust in Jesus, when we become his followers, we're filled with his Holy Spirit, which enables us then to fight temptation. Absolutely crucial. We've got to have the Holy Spirit in us, convicting us, encouraging us, challenging us along the way, bringing Scripture to mind. But the Holy Spirit is crucial. Then this really odd thing happens. Jesus is tempted in the desert. Now let me just read some words for you. And first I'll give you the big idea of the sermon. Like the whole idea. If you, if you completely shut out today, go to sleep the rest of the time, here's what you want to remember. The one idea. When I am tempted to sin, I turn to God's Word for the win. I wanted to give you a simple phrase. When I'm tempted to sin, I turn to God's word for the win. We're going to unpack that the rest of the day. That's a simple phrase. I want you to remember it. I'm going to say it multiple times until you get sick of it. Don't mistake simple for easy. This is actually a master class on the Christian faith this morning. But I know you guys are sharp, and so I know you're going to get this. And we're going to keep coming back to it in upcoming weeks. And so don't feel like, man, if I don't get this today, I'm going to lose it and never going to come back. So uh, here we go. Matthew 4, verse 1. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert so that the devil could test him. And after Jesus had gone without eating for 40 days and nights, he was very hungry. And then the devil came to him and said, If you are God's son, tell these stones to turn into bread. Jesus answered, The scriptures say no one can live only on food. People need every word that God has spoken. Next, the devil took Jesus to the holy city and had him stand on the highest part of the temple. And the devil said, If you are God's son, jump off, because the scriptures say God will give his angels orders about you. They will catch you in their arms, and you won't hurt their, your feet on the stones. But Jesus answered, The scriptures also say, Don't try to test the Lord your God. Finally, the devil took Jesus up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms on earth and their power. And the devil said to him, I will give all of this to you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus answered, Go away, Satan. The scriptures say, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left Jesus and angels came to help him. Now, when you read that passage, one thing we have to address right off the bat is talking about the devil. Uh, you can't be serious about learning from Jesus and understanding what Jesus had to say unless you also understand that he believed there is such a person as Satan, as the devil. Evil is not just some uh, non-personified force through the universe that we, we fight against, but there is a devil. There is a person, the devil, Satan, that is actively against us. There are demons that exist that are actively against us, and Jesus believed that. There's all sorts of stuff beyond the scope of this sermon to go into that, but we as modern, like scientific, uh, sophisticated kind of people poo-poo that. In our heart of hearts, we don't believe it. We don't act on that. We think this is just some pre-scientific world. This is like Thor's hammer, Santa Claus, whatever. This is something that doesn't actually uh, exist. Jesus said, no, you've got to deal with this. This is actually true and it makes a difference. As we think about how Satan tempts us, 
I want to talk a little bit about church history today. I'm a big church history buff, and uh, I want to introduce one of my favorite characters who's only come to my knowledge uh, since January, who has taken a class and learned about a guy, uh, we'll talk about him in a second, Evagrius, Evagrius of Pontus. He was one of the, the desert fathers, the desert fathers and mothers. He lived from like 350 A.D. to 400 A.D., and uh, the Desert Fathers were one of a group of Christians who were living in that time period. Christianity had grown, it had expanded, and now it was the official religion of the Roman Empire. You were no longer persecuted, you were part of the majority. And at the same time as that was going on, Christianity began to be more and more compromised. The average Christian had more and more of the world's influence on them because there was just a way of, of thinking that was being infiltrated in their minds from outside forces. Uh, all the stuff that was growing, as Christianity was growing, all the stuff around them was squeezing them into the mold of the world. And so there were two different reactions that were really significant. One was a group of people called the apologists. They weren't apologizing for Jesus, they were uh, fighting for Jesus. They were the ones like Tertullian. They were like the, the, Chris, uh, or the Tim Kellers of our day the C.S. Lewis of our day. These are the, the men and women who were in the intellectual centers, the urban centers of the world. And they were writing and they were brilliant theologians and they were beginning to write against the Roman philosophy and Greek philosophy and they were trying to help Christianity on an intellectual level stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against the philosophies of the day. And they actually were successful at that in lots of different ways. So you had that group of people who were trying to help Christianity grow and thrive to help people live the good and beautiful life by proving that it was the best way intellectually. There's a second group of people, though, the Desert Fathers and Desert Mothers, who their primary way of combating all of the compromise that was going on in the world around them was to withdraw, to withdraw to the desert. Their, their primary uh, metaphor for the world that was going on around them was the metaphor of a shipwreck. And you kind of feel that way today, potentially. When you look around at the world, you're watching, especially if you're on social media a lot, especially if you're watching the news a lot, you think to yourself, man, this world is a shipwreck. And it is going downhill. And it actually, in lots of ways, it is not. I just went outside yesterday with Denise, and we, we uh, practice this thing we call Verloofs living. My staff makes fun of me. It's, it's a Danish word that means a free air living. So we were outside for 45 minutes yesterday, you know what the temperature was like yesterday, right? Uh, we were outside soaking in the little bit of sun that was coming through. We went for a walk and with the dogs, and we just dress up. And, and, and we're, you know, get, we went outside, and the sun was still shining. It was beautiful. We live in a nice subdivision, and, and we got back in and have a nice hot chocolate or something and just keep warm. Like, the world is not necessarily falling apart the way that we think it is if we're always on, on social media. But... This is the sense that they had in this world, that this world is a shipwreck, and the only way to, be, uh, to, to handle a shipwreck is you've got to grab hold of a, a piece of floating wood and save yourself first before you can save anybody else. And so their instinct was not to argue in the intellectual sense, even though they were brilliant, their instinct was to go off into the desert like Jesus did and fight against temptation, and grow in their faith, and learn what it looked like to walk with Jesus, and to fight temptation, and to grow in union with God. And so Evagrius was one of thousands of people that did just that. They went off into the desert. They would cluster around the Abbas, or the, the fathers, or the Amas, the mothers, and they would learn from these, these usually older wise, like people who were into prayer, who would say that they were close to God and, and would show that in the way that they lived. And so they would go away into the desert and they would seek growth with God. And so that's where Evagrius comes from. And uh, one of the things that has been cool about Evagrius, and I, I picked up his book, one of the books that he wrote, it's called uh, you don't see this, but it's up on the screen. It's called Talking Back. Uh, a mona and here's the subtitle. I love this. A Monastic Handbook for Combating Demons. A Monastic Handbook for Combating Demons. I mean, that was worth the price of the book right there. And that caught my attention. I'm like, well, that's interesting. I've never had a handbook for combating demons before. And so I've been reading Evagrius because he's the guy who came up with the idea of the seven deadly sins. He actually had eight, 
but it got kind of reduced and combined over the years. So this book is verse after verse of helps for him in fighting against the sins of lust and gluttony and anger and, and all the other five in his case. How did they do that? Uh, their goal was to talk back, and that's what this word uh, enteresis, or the, the plural of that enteriticus, means, talking back. They would talk back using Scripture to the demons, to the thoughts. I'm going to go into this a little bit, because this, this seems, all right, I can look, see your eyes. This is cuckoo. It's not. Here's the first thought. These desert fathers uh, taught and believed that the Christian life Christian spirituality is a kind of struggle. It's a struggle. Um, so they would say things like this. When you go off to pray, and when you take your discipleship to Jesus seriously, you do all you can to partner with God, to grow with God, uh, to become a mature person of love, all those sorts of things, that kind of language. When we do that as human beings, there is this oppositional wind against us. There is a force that's actively fighting against us. I've experienced something like this in the real world, in kayaking, for instance. Went kayaking at different times on big water. You go on a big lake, you go on a bay in the ocean, and there are times when it feels like I'm going with the wind, and I'm going fast, and it feels like, man, this is amazing. I feel like Superman. And then you have to turn around and go the other way. And now the wind is against you, the tides are against you, the waves are against you, and it feels like I am doing all that I can just to not go backward. So I feel like I'm Superman with kryptonite next to me, <laughs> if you're a superhero kind of fan. So the idea is, that's how they viewed prayer. And you've experienced that. How many of you have ever, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know 100% of you will raise your hand if, if you were honest. How many of you have tried to pray in an extended way, and you just feel like, man, everything is against me. There's all sorts of thoughts coming into my head, all sorts of stuff. There's this oppositional wind against me. So they believe that Christian life is like that. When we really want to follow Jesus, when we really want to live the good and beautiful life, temptation and these winds just come against us. And they identified the primary enemies as the world, the flesh, and the devil. You've heard that trio before. It's kind of like the anti-trinity. If you have the Father, Son, and Spirit with you, for you, it's the world, the flesh, and the devil that are fighting against you. And it's interesting that their, their motivation for going into the desert was to fight against the devil, to fight against temptation. And they were doing it because they wanted to follow Jesus. They're looking at these words like Matthew 4, 1 and 2, same thing in Luke 4. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert so that the devil could test him. And after Jesus had gone without eating for 40 days and nights, he was very hungry. And so they, they look at Jesus and they're like, look, this is what he did. He went out into the desert, he fasted, and he prayed, and he fought against the devil. So that's what we ought to do. So it's really interesting. A spirituality of struggle. When we really want to grow in our faith, the winds are going to be against us. There's an oppositional force against us. Whenever we want to grow deeper in our intimacy with God, the devil is there pushing back, trying to keep us from doing that. That's the first thought. The second one is this. As they read Matthew 4 and Luke 4, which are these two stories that tell about Jesus being tempted in the de uh, by the devil in the desert, it doesn't read like uh, a Marvel movie. It's not like Jesus and the devil are, he's like with Thanos from the Marvel movies, and they're throwing lightning bullets at each other, and they're battling and all this sort of stuff, and then Jesus takes a rock and he, he crushes Thanos' head, he crushes Satan's head. That's not the way it reads. It reads like a quiet, intellectual debate about truth and about lies. It's about the truth of Scripture and the lies from the devil. And they read this passage along with other places like John in chapter 8 where he says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You reverse engineer that a little bit and it's this idea that we're in bondage actually to lies. Right after that passage, Jesus says, Satan is the father of lies. Whenever he opens his mouth, he's lying. That's his native language. You should be used to the fact that he's always lying to you. And so we shouldn't be surprised if Satan is the father of lies, that as we live as new creations, as we're following Jesus, 
we're going to be fighting lies. That there are deeply embedded lies from our culture, from our past, from our growing up, that we have owned and that control the narrative in our minds. And, and those are the things, and we've got to replace those with the truth of Scripture. So if we're, we've been living over here, we come to Jesus, we still are controlled by a lot of those thoughts and those lies. And so they said, you've got to replace those with Scripture. So far, we doing all right? I'm getting some strange looks. Uh, I told you this is the deep end of the pool. So the, the devil's primary temptation, his attack against us, the battle that he uses in, in their language, they would say that the, the demons, these thoughts are being implanted in us. They call them, it's a Greek word, logosomai. It's a word that's used in Scripture. They're these lies, these thoughts, and this is where it feels a little cuckoo to us, they are demonically animated lies that are being implanted in our minds. That These are the thought patterns. Just think about the thought patterns, the narratives that are going on inside your head. Um, the, they're like the videos that play in our minds. The pictures that come into our head, they call those representations. The the thoughts, pictures that come into our head and they just start poking around in our brains and our imaginations and it's how we interpret the world. And, and they said a lot of those thoughts need to be fought against. They're evil. They're teaching us to live in this world not to follow Jesus. And we've got to replace those lies with the truth. And so Evagrius and all these desert fathers, desert mothers, they full-on thought those are demonically inspired. And again, you think, where's Fuller going with all this? <laughs> Until you think about your own thoughts. Have you ever, just think about your thought life. Have you ever had a thought that, that first off just felt like it had a will to it? Like it wanted to be thought. And, and not only did it want to be thought, it had a power to it. It's like, I can't not think it. There are these things that are going on, and I just can't not think. And it also, have you ever felt like some of those thoughts had like this evil intent to them? They wanted to be thought. They want to overtake your mind and your imagination, consume your mental real estate, if you will, and they want to produce in you anger and bitterness and rage or hurt feelings or fear or shame, there's these things that just, or insecurities. They would say those are actually from the devil, those thoughts. So that's, that's number two. You've got the idea that the Christian life is a struggle, and the struggle is against truth versus lies. And so then the third thing that they taught was that the way to combat those lies was to talk back to talk back to them. To, and it's not a spiritual discipline that you're going to see on any list today. But it's the idea of talking back, counter-talking. A monastic handbook for counter-talking. So here's the idea. This is going to be super practical in a second. Honestly. I know it's a lot of history. The idea was, whenever these logosomai, these thoughts, these images come into my head, come into your head that are going to lead me down the road of ruminating on them, of acting on them, that lead me to anger, that lead me to sin in different ways, that, lead, that are lustful thoughts, that are thoughts of, of gluttony. They're all the different things. Whenever those thoughts come into our head, they said what you need to do is replace them with the truth. Change the channel, if you will. Change the channel from these lies to the truth. You have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had that is empowering him, that's bringing Scripture to memory, that's enabling him to change the channel to truth. We have that same Spirit in us. And so the Bible is not some magic incantation. It's not like you can just pull up a Bible verse and it has this inherent magical ability. I just say it like a spell. That's not the deal. That's not how Jesus operated. Jesus knew Scripture, though. He knew the truth of Scripture and he knew how to combat the lies by replacing it with the truth. 
That's what talking back is all about. And so, uh, again, I give you the phrase, this big idea, whenever I am tempted to sin, I turn to God's word with the win. Evagrius wasn't alone in this. How many of you have ever heard of Augustine, one of the great saints of Catholics, Protestants, like one of the great church fathers? He lived exactly the same years, plus or minus five, as Evagrius. Here's Augustine. He said, if in Christ, because they all believed that we should look at this passage in Matthew, in the same passage in Luke, and learn from Jesus how to fight against temptation and have victory over that. They believed this. So St. Augustine said, if in Christ we've been tempted, in him we overcome the devil. Do you think only of Christ's temptations and fail to think of his victory? See yourself as tempted in him and see yourself as victorious in him. He could have kept the devil from himself, but if he were not tempted, he could not teach you how to triumph over temptation. Three times Jesus is tempted. Three times he uses scripture to replace the lies with the truth. That's how he does this. And you might think to yourself, uh, well, wh- how does he do that? Look, just look at the passage with me. Matthew 4, and I, I won't go into d- great detail about how he's doing this, but Matthew 4, I'm just going to read this, verse 3 and 4. He says, um, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, now it's interesting, he had already just passed, uh, just in the verse before, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, the Father says, This is my Son. And so immediately the tempter is telling a lie. He's like, well, if that's really true, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Lots of in ways of looking at this passage, but one of the key ways I think is honestly very, very true for us and for Jesus is that he's being tempted to fill a hole in him, an appetite, with something that is non-God. He's being tempted to fill the appetite of hunger because he's hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days. Do it by doing something that God doesn't approve of. We do this all the time. We have appetites of all sorts of different ways, a hole in us that we fill with all sorts of non-God ways. We have the hole of food, of, of hunger that we fill with food, maybe too much, too little, wrong kinds of food. We have sexual appetites we fill in the wrong ways. We have appetites for stuff that we fill in the wrong ways, all sorts of different ways that we fall into the same exact temptation. Jesus overcomes that by using Scripture. And then it says, the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up your hands, and you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answers with Scripture. The devil wanted to create like a YouTube moment, a video moment where it goes viral that shows him, shows Jesus like magically protecting himself. Jesus says it's also written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. How many times have you ever tried to live life your own way on this side of thing and then when things are going bad, you, you ask Jesus, you ask God to fix it for you? That's exactly what's going on here, that temptation. Again, the devil, verse 8, took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Worship non-God. <laughs> worship in other ways and just hope things will work out. Take a shortcut to the spiritual growth that God wants for you. And he says, away from me, Satan. It is written. Again, he quotes scripture. He talks back. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. We have the same Holy Spirit in us that helps us to talk back using the word that's written by the Holy Spirit, empowered in us by the Holy Spirit. We recall those words through the Holy Spirit. When I'm tempted to sin, I turn to God's truth for the win. Now you're thinking to yourself, because I can hear it in you. I can hear your voices, sort of. And you're saying, come on, is this anywhere else in the Bible? Is this really true? Just look at a couple passages with me on the screen. Ephesians 2, verse 1 and 3. Paul says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He's talking about Satan, the spirit who is now in work, at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings 
of our flesh, following its desires and its thoughts. That's where we were, and it still is affecting us. But 2 Corinthians, the same Paul says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. He's talking about Scripture. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. One more for you, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, St. Paul says this, whatever is true and noble, right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Scripture teaches this idea of changing the channel. So does science, actually. I want to just walk down this road with you for a little bit. Neuroscience is actually uh, a fascinating field. It's way above my pay grade, but this, this idea of changing the channel is actually really profound. It turns out when we think about habits that are formed, you've heard the phrase, you know, if you want to have a new habit, you've got to do something for X number of days in a row in order for the habit to stick. What's going on in our brains is that when we experience something, when we do something, we begin to uh, create a neural pathway in our brains, a, a rut, a channel in our brains that brings us pleasure and we, we start to do that. So uh, something happens and we start to develop a habit. That rut, that channel gets deeper and deeper and deeper until there are things that we can do. There are temptations that we experience, there are triggers that we have, there are smells that cause us to go down different roads and it feels like in our minds we can't not go down those roads because those channels have gotten so deep, those neural pathways have gotten so deep. And so when they talk about changing habits, one of the things that they talk about is you've got to create new channels, new neural pathways. And so to do that, you do something different and work on that and you develop a habit. Some people say you're, you're, when you begin life, there are different things that happen and your mind is imprinted in certain ways and, and this is the way that you're going to act. This is your default. This is the rut. This is the channel. In order to change that, you need to change the channel. You need to think of something different, do something different, until that develops as a new habit. So this idea is actually really profound. You guys with me? Uh, let me get really, really practical. Here we go. This is also kind of um, vulnerable. How does this work? I told you we're going to work through this for the next weeks. Uh, I gave you even a handout today to practice this a little bit. Um, the best approach in the neuroscience is to combine a verbal because uh, we're audible people, you say something. And you also picture something. And you also uh, have a tangible physical um, movement or a symbol. How does this work? Um, when I am tempted to lust, how many, are you, now you're interested. <laughs> uh, when I am tempted to lust, when there is... Um, you get you're on your phone, you're on your phone and you, you are look at the news or whatever and you see something come up and it says, it's clickbait. Everybody has experienced clickbait. Um, you won't believe what so-and-so looks like in a skimpy bikini. What keeps you from going there? What keeps you from ruminating on somebody that you see that you're thinking, wow, that would be a really interesting person to get with? Or what happens in your mind when you're tempted to look at porn? There's all sorts of stuff that's going on. There's all sorts of triggers that are happening in your mind. How do I fight against that? See, I'm working through this, this sort of idea, and I want to help you with this, because there are three things. One is the, the truth. There are multiple scriptures that I have memorized for years, that as soon as some of those thoughts come into your head, because the idea is change the channel as fast as you can. Don't wait and start thinking about these things, because you're going to go down a road that you're not going to want to uh, experience. So you start thinking about those things, immediately those verses come into my head. There are lots of different ones. I can share a couple with you. One is from Job 31. He, he says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. I'll say that out loud. As I'm saying that truth out loud, 
there's a mental picture that I have in my head. There's a picture in my house. I can tell you right where it's sitting. It's a picture of my wife and I on our wedding day. And we're both smiling, and I put myself in that moment where I'm standing there at the altar with my bride, and I'm promising my life to her, and she's promising her life to me. And I sit in that moment, and I just think about the joy that we were experiencing and have experienced since then in our marriage. And I think about how hurtful it would be if I went down this road of giving in to the temptation of lust and think of the tears in her eyes. And so I just sit in that moment. So I'm saying those words uh, as I'm sitting in that moment. And then to make it even better, this is not Bible. This is just how science helps us with this. As I'm saying those words of Scripture and I'm visualizing the, the joy of not giving in to the temptation, the pain if I did, I'm also making a physical symbol. And so I will actually cut my hands like I'm holding Denise's face in my hands. And I will, we're audible people. Um, so I'll cup Denise's face. She's not even with me. I'll cup her face in my hands and I'll hold my hands like this as I'm saying those words. I make a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully after a woman and I'm imagining my wife in my mind. Those are th- some things. That's the way I want, to, want us to approach this. I'll give you another example. I know we're, we're running a little bit late and that's okay because this is so powerful. Discouragement can also be something I, I battle with. I wake up in the morning and there's a face that appears in my mind. A representation, to use Evagoras' turn. A face that appears in my mind and it's somebody from the church or that used to be at the church and sometimes it's real, sometimes it's imaginary, but they're, they're saying, you're not a very good pastor. You're not a good preacher. Your sermons go long. They're boring. We're not a good leader. Our kids' ministry is somewhere else. They've left the church. Any number of things that can be discouraging. I know that there's a lie that I'm believing that's deeply embedded in me that I'm not good enough or that I need to be better in order to be accepted by people or that I'm not loved. I mean, there are some deeply embedded lies that I have, just like you have some of those deeply embedded lies. And so when that picture comes into my head, it's easy for me to start ruminating, get discouraged and think, man, it's all true. I am terrible. How do you fight against that? I'm practicing the sort of thing that I'm trying to convince you is actually biblical. I will, and among other things, one of the things that I have begun doing is to say um, the words of Joshua 1.9, which has always been one of my favorite verses, where God tells Joshua, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for I, the Lord, your God, am with you every step of the way. And as I'm saying those words out loud, because that's actually important to hear my ears hear the words that I'm saying, as I'm saying those words of Scripture and talking back, I'm imagining in my mind the picture of being up on top of the plateau of Masada overlooking the Dead Sea in Israel. This massive fortress as the Roman armies, if you don't know much about history, I'll I'll go into it some later, but uh, the, the Roman armies are building their ramparts up to try to take over this fortress. And I'm sitting there on top of that. I'm visualizing that in my head as I'm saying these words. Don't be discouraged. And God is with me as I'm up there, and he's smiling at me. And then a physical symbol, and, and uh, a physical symbol, it might seem goofy, I just, I could do like a Hail Michigan, help. Go, it's just a thumbs up. So I'm physically holding my thumb up, imagining God there with me, saying these words of scripture, and I do that until the thought, the discouragement starts to go away. It doesn't happen immediately. I'm telling you this is the long haul for us. But this is something I want to encourage us to participate in. It's different for everyone. You might feel worthless. Maybe you're visualizing a a massive diamond and God saying the words of 1 Peter in your mind. You're my my child. You're my treasure. And at the same time, you're doing your best bodybuilder pose or something. I don't know. I don't know what it is for you. But you struggle. I know you do. With greed and with anger, you feel with shame, you feel you've given into the temptation of gossip or drinking too much or whatever it is. We have all sorts of temptations to live this way. My encouragement to us is to follow the model of Jesus, to talk back to those things, to change the channel to the truth of Scripture. We went a long time today.
You guys are awesome. You stuck with me. Hopefully when you came, you grabbed one of these. I want to encourage you to pull it out or when you leave, grab one of these. This is, I don't want to give you all the answers. I just shared some ways that I changed the channel. Those aren't your ways. This book has 400 different scriptures, like scenarios of temptations and the scriptures that he developed over time that he taught. I think the way that it works best is that the Holy Spirit teaches us and we grow and we develop our own handbook for combating those lies. And so this is a way for you to work through some of those things and it just follows the same sort of step that I just did. Talking back to temptation, uh, what is the thought, feeling, temptation, sensation that I have? It's anxiousness over losing money or whatever it is, any number of things. Walk through this. Practice this. You with me? Try this. It's not going to work right away. It's not a magic formula. But as you walk with God, you have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus did. Jesus says no to the devil. Whenever you're tempted by sin, turn to God's word for the win. So Father, today, um, lots of stuff, lots of words, Use the words of Jesus and the way that Jesus approached temptation, the way that he fought against sin, the way that he fought against the devil. Teach us today how to do that. Teach us to practice that. Help us to talk through that together, to share how we have fought temptation with other people who are struggling with the same sorts of things. Help us to learn together as your people. Help us to grow in our faith. Help us to live the good and beautiful life. And one of the key ways that we do that to pursue virtue is to talk back to the lies that try to tell us that every other way but the Jesus way is good. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand together and continue our uh, attitude of prayer as we sing uh, this hymn to the Lord. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. As you leave today, I encourage you to raise your hands and receive this blessing or charge, depending on how you want to see it today.
Mm -mm. May God grant you the desire to glorify him in all that you do and say. And may he give you the strength through the Holy Spirit to fight against temptation, to live the good and beautiful life. Amen and amen. Amen.